I was, I was, you know, leaning on the Lord back there this morning on the couch and, and laying before him. Um, he said something that he wanted us to proclaim this morning. And we'll release the kids. Go ahead, children, if you, you know, the young folks. Um, I'm going to ask the adults to stand with me that wish to. You don't have to. But what the Lord said for us to do this morning is to stand in his presence and to speak this out. Our destiny is an ancient call. It, our destiny has an ancient call in our lives, and we need to speak to it to awaken. Our destiny is an ancient call on our lives, and we need to speak it to awaken it. So what I'm going to ask you to do as we get ready, I'm just going to say, awaken, O destiny. Can you do that with me in faith? Because there's, there's a time that you start to speak and shake the things that, that have been slumbering. All right? And there's such a, a, a sense of destiny that's in this house for us. Okay? All right. So one, two, three. Awaken, O oh destiny. In Jesus' name, thank you. And know that that is something that you've spoken into, and God will honor that cry. And be watchful of it as it, as it stirs from slumber. Amen? Go ahead and be seated. Amen. Because your destiny is something that is, is within God's timeline. And as we walk these things out, God sets before us events and, and opportunities to walk in. And so many times we just totally miss it. We just go blowing on by. Oh, that was nice. That was pretty, whatever it was. And we're just, we're just chugging along. And God's saying, would you not tarry with me? Would you not tarry with me? And it's like, oh, you know, when Dad says that, I go, oh, yeah. It's like when my one wonderful, loving wife says, honey, would you come sit on the couch? I'm going, oh, yeah, I'm all about that. And it's the same way my love for my father is that way. When he says, Mike, would you just tarry for a second? And I'm going, oh, yeah. Because I know, I know that he has something that's special he wants to impart. He wants to just, and not only do I want to, to be touched, I want to touch him. You know, the reality of the, of the experience of being touched by God and then touching him back, you know, knowing that you've stirred desire and love in his heart, there's nothing like that. There's just nothing like that. Hallelujah. So, th Father, I thank you for our destiny that is, it is awaking and it is stirring. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your intercession for today that it has covered all the bases that we set in such a precise place of blessing today. Lord, I thank you that you've stirred our hearts with passion and desire and longing for your presence and for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm. Hallelujah. Well, I just want to quickly, uh, as Patty has said, we were down at Eagle Mountain at the Prophetic Roundtable. We were invited down there. It was really a, a, a great time of blessing. And I just wanted to... Uh, what I do with uh, the things that come forth at the prophetic roundtable, uh, it's usually spoken, spoken over our region and our territory. And the, God's using the, the word territory in me. That's, that's because I'm a territorial person. That, that, that word speaks. Regions is a business term, and I can't, uh, I can't uh, connect with that. But territory is something I totally understand because I've been territorial since the time I come out of the womb. So I understand territory. So when God says, you know, we speak to this territory and what is God is speaking over this area, the Northwest, and I just wanted to bring it into our house so that we can get an understanding. Uh, these are things uh, from the prophetic roundtable that I glance at uh, is the way I want to put it. I glance at them. God has set his timetable, and we're moving forward, and we're moving, in, and our steps are directed. But there are certain events and things that he has spoken, that I just want to make sure that we're, we're watching. That, yep, that's okay, that's good. It's there, and it speaks into us. And, and you'll get a under, better understanding of that. It's like when you're riding, driving down the road, and you're not sure if you're still on I-5 or Interstate 5, or just like some back road. And every once in a while, you'll find signs, right? All right, and it's like, whew, I'm still on the right road. You'll see roads split off, and it's like, there's no road signs. Am I, am I still on the right road? And that's what the prophetic roundtable really does. Uh, one of the things that I use it for is to bring clarity that we're on track. Uh, it reinforces the things that God has said. So um, as we go through, there's about 13 of them. I threw them back there at Patty. Uh, so we'll bring these up on the overhead. We're trying to, uh, I'm trying to, uh, 
uh, with, the, with the help of my uh, Wonder Woman wife back there to uh, get more PowerPoint style uh, ability to write stuff down because when it comes out of me, sometimes I can't repeat it. But if I can follow it along on a piece of paper, it'll get into you and you can reinforce it by writing it and reading it. So, Father, we just honor you today. Lord, I thank you for the, the insight that you're going to be uh, releasing here today, that it will impact us and help us to, to, to tighten, to tighten things up in the spirit realm so we have a clearer understanding of, of what you're saying over our lives, over our family church, and over this territory that you have placed us in, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So, number one, I don't know if I need, I got my little laser here, let's see. It's fired up. Number one, is it awakened? Okay, she's. it's an awakening thing. A mm. little bit chilly on the pumpkin this morning, huh? I got here this morning, it was like 60 degrees in here. I'm like, hallelujah, man, we're ready for the fire of God to show up. You'll see that we have a new uh, painting on the wall. Uh, that's, uh, that's the one. I, I've, I see there's supposed to be four that the Lord has shown me. That's the first one is the rest, restore. It's part of what we are, restoration, place of rest, refreshing, restoration. I'm not sure what the other three will be, but they'll be placed on that wall. Uh, we have our faith and believe over here, and there's something else that God has, has uh, commissioned to an individual to put over here. But we're going to have things that speak of who we are and speak about the kingship of the Lord in this house. As you, and just as you saw when you enter in, you see that the cross in the, in the entryway. And we have that because we enter into his kingdom through the cross. But I, the only place other than my office in this room are the crosses in there. And that's really, that office is really just, there's walls there. Okay? This room has the crown because this is the place of the king's chamber. This is his, this is his royal throne room. And when we enter in here, we are brought in as priests and kings. And that's the mentality I want to, to take us to. This is where the Lord is arising, this group of people. So here we go. Number one, we must learn to hear the frequencies of others and allow them to clarify how we can connect with them and align with them. In, in what God is doing in this, in this territory, there's a, a, a lot of uh, connecting going on. And what that will require is it will require us to learn to hear the frequencies of others and allow them to clarify how, where we connect, where we can align. Um, the body and the church of Redmond is not just this house or maybe two or three others. There is, there is a whole big old family here. And if we neglect that part of the family because they don't align with us precisely with what we believe, we have, we've taken the feet off of it. And we're running around trying to run without feet. We have to realize that the body of Christ is a true body. Just because we're not all eyes, ears, and noses and everything else doesn't mean that we, we can't function together. Um, the challenges that we face is to be able to, to walk in love in a way that is receptive. When I sit down with one of my denominational brothers and they come out of their denominational language, okay, that's their frequency. That's what this means, the frequency. Hear their frequencies and allow them to clarify it. You know, when, they, when, we, when we speak stuff, man, we're, we're, sometimes we're talking way over their heads, and they're going, where are you at? What are you talking about? I've never heard about this. You know, so we have to be able to put it in a language that they can understand and learn to listen with an ear that's, that can hear what they're saying. You know, when we come alongside other churches to see things done in this town, we don't all speak the same language. Bless God. Thank goodness we don't. You know, when you go into a country and everybody's speaking one language, how odd do you feel when you don't understand the language? You're going, man, I don't have a clue what they're saying. But when God is releasing his desire to sweep people, in, to sweep people into the kingdom, he has to have every language imaginable out there that people can connect to. Amen? Amen. All right, so this is what's going to be challenging, that we're going to see God's call in this region and territory for us to start being able to learn to be around each other and, and just to hear each other's language and understand it. It really is a desperate need because there's a harvest out there that depends upon the body and the church of Christ to get alongside of each other and quit running away from each other and, and fighting and bickering and get about the harvest because the harvest is at stake. And if we don't get ourselves aligned with God's heart, 
He's going to say, you know what? I'm going to find somebody that carries my heart, and we're going to get this done. Because it's his heart and his urgency to get this through. And I don't want to miss our part. I really don't. I don't want to miss our section of responsibility because he has entrusted us, this family, to walk in a specific area. And that's what we're doing in Jesus' name. We are, our, we are coming into the place where we understand and we're walking in unity corporately. We're doing things that is wonderful what God is doing in this family. And I, I honor you and I thank you for standing with me. And I love every one of you because you're important to his heart. You're important to his heart. That's what makes you important to me. And then as I connect with you, then the friendship and the bonds of love are strengthened and built. Okay? All right, number two. Hallelujah. See how quick she is on on switching. There we go, man. She's good. We need to expand our legitimate inputs. Now, that that one's kind of hard to get your head around. As we step into what God's doing, um, there's a lot of stretching he's going to require. How about that? Okay? He's going to require us to be uh, not so stringent, like bound up. I mean, there's times, I, you know, I, in my life, I've done a lot of outside-the-box studies and, and pressed into other things just so I can understand where people come from. It helps me understand their language, their frequency. All right? So this one kind of builds off the first one. Just because uh, I may not understand what one of the denominational brothers is or even those that are more prophetic or more apostolic or more whatever than myself, I don't want to limit my, my ability to learn. Because we, it, when you stop learning, what happens? You shut off. When you cease to learn, you become stiff-necked, and you say, well, they can't speak into my life. Well, you know what? I've had, and I'll be honest with you, I've had non-Christians on the street speak into my heart louder than most of my brother. Man, I'll tell you, that hurts. You know, I feel like Balaam. There's that mule, and he's speaking into my life. He saved my life. I'm the stupid donkey that didn't get it the first time around. So we have to start really being able to stretch outside of our boundaries. Find those places of legitimate input, legitimate. I'm not talking about running down to the spirit place down there by off, off the old vineyard church where the spiritual thing is and sitting there and listening to all that stuff. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about legitimate ones that God sets before you. He has those divine appointments which says, you know what, this brother has a really great impact and truth about this. Why don't you study on that? And those are where you start to go, ooh, it's a little uncomfortable, but I can feel it stretching. Because you know what? Yeah, I mean, Tom and, and Nicole, man, they know all about stretching. When you do ramp up or what, on ramp, what do you do? Okay? Er, yeah, I mean, you, you get people to do squats and stuff just to get the muscles stretched out a little bit, right? Okay? And it's not always fun. And how much, how much puking goes on? Okay? A little bit. Thank God, no? Man, I'll tell you, I wanted to throw up. I wanted to throw up watching those people. Just watch it. No, she's shh, shh. Yeah, don't let out the secret, okay? But I want to tell you, when you start seeing, I know, I know it's not. Oh, come on, it's spectator sport, right? No, but it is. I mean, you get, you start getting really uncomfortable. You put your body through things. And, you, and when you're stretching your spirit, I'll tell you, the first time you start walking in, on the water, you're going to be going, oh, glory to God. God calls you out of that boat says, come on, we're going to stretch your little arms a little bit. We're going to see how well you walk in this area. It's not easy. You know, I, I remember when I first got into uh, way back in the 90s when I started walking with us among, among some of the apostolic people, uh, Jonathan David and some of the other guys that I was with uh, that I studied off of, the church I was in going, they didn't want anything to do with it. They are the ones that paid to take me down to this conference. And they're going, oh, forget everything they told you. I went, oh, wait a minute. I like their frequency because they speak into what I'm, uh, where I'm at, see? And I stretched and I stretched and I stretched and I, and I learned and I watched because it was, a, it, was a, it was outside of the comfort zone of where I was at, but I knew it was a legitimate in place, a place of input. So, you know, get ready for that. You know, allow the spirit, linger with him, tarry with him, and let him stretch a little bit. The first time we started talking about the 444 uh, frequency and the, the change of music, and you guys don't have any idea about that. I've mentioned it, it was probably last year. 
we changed from the 440 normal uh, frequency to the 444 frequency because of stuff that we've studied, stuff that we understood and learned as leadership. It, it sets a uh, it sets a different tone, and I and it, that's something if you're interested in, we can talk about on the side. But you know, these are the these are the things you find legitimate to do to bring a change and relax a, and uh, blessing in your life. Number three, honey. This one's going to be uh, this one's going to be a challenge to some. Okay, what's that word right there? Superficial connections. You know, uh, it's it's streamlining, folks. It really is. A superficial connections must die for the sake of unity and depth of relationship. What that means, okay, we don't do things just for the sake of unity. We're talking about depth of relationship. Unity has is is. Uh, in the man's form, is union. And what does a union normally do? And I'm not slamming unions. They were all good in their time, but they bring power struggle. Unity with the Tower of Babel was man-based. We're not looking for the unity for the sake of unity. We're looking for some superficial connections to die. Because what happens, superficial things, superficial things are just that surface stuff. You kind of walk up and you bump elbows and you rub elbows, but there's really not a connection. All right, we're talking about depth of relationship. There's in this family, we're we're encouraging all of us to build deeper ties of relationship, to get in or into each other's houses and to love on each other. You know, we're looking for for uh, in the near future, and I've been speaking this and speaking it until it manifests. Well, we will have those little groups during the week where people's houses are open to do specific teachings and trainings and, and the stuff that I don't have the time for a Sunday to do, okay? So this is what I'm encouraging, the deeper relationship in the family. And they come into the understanding where, you know, superficial stuff, there's things that take life force from you. I call it life force. And, and the Lord graciously allows me to do that. But in my life, it's coming to the place where, you know what, that's superficial, and I've got to flow in a more precise, accurate way. So I have to make a tough choice, all right? And this is where I have to allow certain things to go to the wayside. And uh, you'll realize the same thing in your life. Those superficial relationships that are just like butterflies along the highway, you kind of float around together, and there's not real fruit. Those have to go away because you've got to start majoring on those majors that God has set in your life. Don't, mi- don't major on the minors. Majors on the majors, okay? All right, number four. Hallelujah. For transformation, we must ask the right questions. When they were discussing this down there, it was uh, that, that one I went, okay, ask the right questions. For transformation, we must ask the right questions. And this is individual for you folks. When you truly desire transformation, you'll ask the right question because he gives you the desire of your heart. If you desire transformation in your life, he'll give you the question to ask of him. In my life, I'll share share with you my question. My question to the Lord was, when I heard this the first time, is like, Lord, what am I doing that is taking place? more time than it benefits to me or benefits my ministry or benefits your kingdom. And uh, because, you know, there's a lot of opportunities that I have. There are. And there's a lot of call and draw in my life. And I cannot go beyond, um, I can't afford to go beyond what I'm required to do or what I've been asked to do. And I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, but you know that when you have so much life force, you only have so much. And you've got to walk in wisdom, otherwise you start burning out. And thank God, that's he's given me wisdom since I was very young. I burned out one time when I was in ministry. I was in 1987, uh, just before maybe almost 1990 or 1988. And I hit a wall because I was running on my own strength. So I had to have a transformation in my life. 
And that was when I started asking the questions. All right, And out of that question and answer time with the Lord, he's helped train me. And I'm just giving you some pointers. Find out. Find out. Ask the right questions. Because transformation is, you know, people say change is a way of life. I'm taking it a notch higher. Transformation is beyond change. Change is nothing than maybe this. Transformation is going, yo, and then that way. Okay? Okay? It's like that. You just get, you're going not just right. I mean, it's three all around. Transformation's like that. And you're hanging on for dear life. That's transformation. That's what I desire. I don't want just change. Change is just, it's super, super, superficial, surface stuff. Transformation, man, it blows everything out of the water, reformulates it, and puts it in God's form and what he desires. Hallelujah. The next one, I think uh, everybody will fit into this one, at least hallelujah. Number five. This is my seat. How about that? I wonder what everybody's snickering about. There it is. Hallelujah. She's working through it. That's okay. I love that. Yes. Yes. Number five. Misfits are now those who are sought after. Why? Why? Because God made us this way. God has designed us. You know, when you have a machine and it's built a certain way, all right, and it's got certain cogs that make it run at a certain speed, then there's those that are misfits that don't fit in yet. But you know what happens when you take a cog that's, that's about this size and then you put in a cog this size? All of a sudden it changes speed. All right? When you have a 10-speed or a 21-speed or whatever, you know, you have all these different sizes. But have you ever seen the bicycles that run on the, the salt flats that go 100 miles an hour? They have one big flipping cog. And, man, they get that thing ramped up and it goes. And see, the misfits don't fit in the norm. We don't fit in the normal movement and, and timing of the earth or man. We are the misfits, if I could use that term, of God because he designed us specifically different than others. And there's nothing wrong with being that different because you carry the handcraftedness of your Father. Do you hear what I just said? If you're not shouting amen on that, you haven't figured out who you are in Christ yet. Because you are hand-designed, crafted by him for a specific time, for a specific purpose to be a part of his kingdom and the movement and momentum of heaven. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We are the ones that have been made for this moment in time. This moment in time. I like that phrase. That one speaks to me. It's not the times that we live in, but we are made for this moment in time. That's a very precious and it's, 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 it's very intimate, a moment in time. Hallelujah. Number six, there's some things that are going on in the spirit. And I'll tell you, there's been movement around this region and territory. Um, whew, I'll, I'll, just a second. My daughter, bless her heart, in the past, in Jesus' name, has had the ability to get car sick when I drive. I take all responsibility for that. But when you have movement, like I drive, she would just, Dad? And I'm going, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Lord Jesus. Okay, I'll take the corners a little slower. I'll slow down before I hit the brakes at the stop sign. I won't take off like jackrabbits. At the, okay? But see, number six, the Father is resetting timelines and destinies. There is a lot. There's been so much movement that I've been feeling and seeing in the Spirit that I'm almost getting car sick because God's on the move and unbelievable. As he allows me to look, there is movement on me, and I'm telling you, it's like, it's like watching ants just scurrying every which way. There is such a movement of the kingdom. His plans and things have been, are, are on the move like I've never seen around here. And I, yes, hallelujah, I say amen to that because you know what? 
just as I spoke probably last spring about a mustering, a mustering for the engagement, um, there is there is a lot of movement, and God's aligning people and 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 events and stuff. That's just oh glory to God. And what's really cool about this is He is resetting the timelines and destinies. That was one of the things they spoke about. If you feel that you've missed your opportunity, I want to tell you you haven't. You have not missed your opportunity. You have not been disqualified from your destiny. It's just a matter of setting yourself back into t- the timing of the Lord. He is resetting the timelines. Uh, they talked about a, a, a specific movie, and, and what happened is when you, this individual came in agreement with, with their father, it reset all the timelines, and the blessing came into the family. So God is doing in this in our area right now is He's resetting things. He's making sure that we're back on the in the proper placement. He's picking us up by His hand and saying, "There, you you saw where you went astray. How you just missed that timing, the rhythm, just a little bit. But I've got you back on track. Now you know what to do. You know how it feels when you get a little bit off to the right or the left. So now you're going to stay right on plumb." You're going to stay dead on target, right on plum, and you're going to be just fine. All right? Your destiny has not been forfeited. It has not been uh, bypassed you. Stop saying that you have missed the boat. Because you know what? We don't live in a boat. We walk on water. Amen. Amen. It's right. You don't need a boat when you walk on water. When you start walking in the spirit realm like that, so your destiny has not been lost. The blessing of God is still upon you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for resetting those things that we have not missed. And I thank you that you breathe encouragement into us. Number seven, mm. the man-made versus God-made boundaries. This is really critical. This is really critical. Um, in the spirit realm and what God is calling the, the body of Christ in this, in this territory to come into is man makes boundaries, makes boundaries. It's, it's like the boat thing. You can only go places in the boat. No, no. God's boundary is, is not anywhere like that. His boundaries are where is your faith? That is where your boundary is. Have you ever thought about that? Your, your boundaries are set by your faith. And what God has said to do with your faith. When, he, when you engage your faith by a word of the Lord that he has spoken into the midst of you, that is your new boundary. This is the new reality. This is the new understanding of where you are. It's very interesting when you run into that line of faith and the gift of faith becomes active and alive inside of you that there, was, there's, there is no denying the fact of what God has said to you. When God, and you know who I'm talking about, you've run into those people that you can't talk out of what God has told them. And it's like, you know, there is such a, a gift of faith in them that if, they, if God said to walk through that wall, they would walk right through it. They'd walk right over there and they'd go right through it and you'd go, <gasps> That's the sort of, you know, that's the sort of alignment God's going to start doing in his people because you know what? The times that we're in demand that the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. And it's going to take that kind of walk to, to see this. When you have someone that's, that's right before you dying and you speak life into them or they're about ready to kill themselves and you arrest that in the spirit, that suicidal spirit, and all of a sudden they come out of it. You see it in their eyes. They go, oh, what was I thinking? See, that's what I'm talking about. It takes a reality place here, folks. It really does. Those boundaries that, that God made and man made, are not, they're distinctly different. And we have to start learning what our spiritual boundaries are. I'm learning what they are in the position that I'm in now, in this day, in this moment of time, in my life and my destiny. And that's the thing that I challenge you with. Find your timing. Find your boundaries. Uh, and when you go past your boundary, you will know. You'll suddenly feel like, uh-oh, I'm a little bit out here on the thin ice, and I can feel it's getting a little sketchy. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go back. I'm just going to ease back because that's, then you'll feel, 
you'll feel the solidity of God in that place. All right? You know when you're stretching your faith, you're taking it just, but you know what? That's okay. God understands that. He graces that. But he also says, you know what? You're getting a little close to the envelope edge. There's nothing wrong with going and standing on the edge of a cliff. Has anybody stood in the edge of the Grand Canyon? Okay? Or in the edge of that, that place of faith? Yeah. But I tell you, you go up to the top of Smith Rocks and you go to that little place and you know that it's about 3,000 feet down. And you go, and it's solid. And then you look up and you do this. Because you know why? Because I'm looking up because I'm not going down. You stand on the precipice and you look up because you're not going down. Your feet are solidly upon the rock. Okay? Okay. I look into the hills from whence my help comes from. I can stand on a precipice and look to see what his word will speak to me and say to me. Hallelujah. The thing that God is really, really, really pushing for right now is this. Humility within God's boundaries, but beyond man's boundaries, receives the blessing. Humility within God's boundaries. Humility within his boundaries. You'll know. You'll know the flavor. You'll know who carries humility. You know, it is, it's a dangerous thing to run around within the boundaries of God with pride. Man, I'll tell you, there's nothing like a God smackdown. Yeah, absolutely. It's a painful thing. But you know what? He does that for our own protection because when we start running amok, who, we, who do we endanger beside ourselves? Only God knows. So recognize that. Okay? It takes a place of rest and understanding. Hallelujah. Take me to number eight. Don't stretch or press beyond your measure of a man. The, the stretching and the pressing. These, these are words are very, uh, they're out there. You know, when I, start, when I articulate, you know, let's stretch or let's press into the things of the Lord, those are hard words to understand, okay? It takes an understanding of yourselves and pressing in, as I said right there, press. What do you do when you're pressing the Lord? I'm, I'm always about, you know, when the kids press you, when your children are always pressing, you know what it feels like. But when they're pressing for a good reason, not for selfish reasons, because they're at humility, walking in humility, and they want to see the, the house blessing, it's okay to press God. It's like, it's like what happened when those guys saw the, uh, the invalid and they tore the roof off the house to get the guy in there where Jesus could touch him. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. That's where you press. It's who, and how did the guy get healed? The faith of those that brought him. It was their faith that brought the deliverance, not the man's faith. See, this is how you press does that make, is that a good example? Do you understand that one? It's where unity and corporately we press into the kingdom and it releases those things. That's where faith comes alongside and we stand. And when you've done all to stand, then stand. It's where you are together in unity with your brothers and sisters on an event that's tough. If we, you know, when people are ill or they come in here that are injured, you know, from other churches or for whatever reason, they're hurt, this is the hospital. And we love on them, and we cover them, and we pray for them. That's where we can press in because they're too weak to press in. We stand in the gap for them. Amen? All right, so the measure of a man. I want to go ahead and, uh, let's see, make sure I got this right. Patty, do you have Jeremiah 12, 5? Go ahead and bring that up. Hmm. If you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, wearied you, then how can you contend with horses? And if in the land of peace in which you trusted they wearied you, then how will you do in the floodplain of the Jordan? This is the sort of this is the the stretching that I believe the Lord is going to start doing with us. And this is the scripture he laid on my heart. It's, I've been kind of bouncing around for a, about a month now. Um, it really deals with finding the boundaries that God has for us. It really speaks into uh, stretching and pressing of the measure of the man. 
who is the measure that we are supposed to obtain? The stature of who? Christ, right? We know that's in Ephesians. So the measure of the man of who we are to be and be in the image of is Jesus Christ. And we need to learn what the boundaries are of what Christ was. And then we, learn, we align ourselves with how we understand ourselves. Um, it really is. You know what? I know where my, my faith is not as strong in areas. Okay? And I, I know you know your, your levels of strength and where you know your faith is. And this is where we want to start pressing those boundaries, and we want to get to this place. If you have run with footmen and they have worried you, that's, the, that's that place of faith inside of you. I'm not really good in this realm of faith, or I'm not really good in this area. And I've gotten weary there. Just running with regular folks, all right? Then how can you contend with the horses? How is my, you know, I know there's certain places in, in my faith, man, I run like a Mustang, baby. I'm like revved up, ready to go, and I am girded up, and I'm ready to tear it up and move. But then there's those places where I'm weak and I'm not real strong. So those are the places I start lo- asking the Lord. I press him, Lord, help me to be strengthened. Strengthen me so I can come into the full measure of the man of Jesus Christ. Because you know what? As long as I'm in this body, I need to walk in the measure of the image of the man, Jesus Christ. Because he walked in all authority. And that's where we are trying to, we are, that God desires us to be in the image of his son. Amen? So this is what, this is really, I'm taking you outside the box and it may be hurting your head to think this way, but you uh, corporately, individually, we are to be in the image of Christ. And I like this. And in the land of peace in which you trusted, you, they wearied you. How will you do in the floodplain of the Jordan? When things really get turned up, where's your faith going to be? Yee! That's, yeah, that's exactly how I feel sometimes. Yee! You do that little wincing, and you're kind of waiting for the windshield to hit you, and you're the bug, and you're going, bang, 55 miles an hour because we're staying under the speed limit. Okay? Hallelujah. Patty, if you bring up Ephesians 4.13, this is that measure of the man. I want to give you the scriptures to back this up. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, the knowledge of the Son of God to pursue him, to press into him till we get of the knowledge of who he is, to understand how he walked on this earth, to press in, to tarry with him so we can get a full understanding of who he was upon the earth, how he walked, how he would sit amongst the sinners. Have you, you know, how comfortable are you when he calls you in the marketplace to just be yourself around the regular folks, the, the harvest. I want to give you a picture, folks. This may sting a little bit, but I want to tell you something. When you are sitting in the midst of ungodly people, how do you see them? Do you see them as a contagion that will taint you, or do you see them as a ripe harvest like a beautiful red apple a beautiful pepper, a beautiful tomato, whatever vegetable that you desire or fruit, do you see them as a harvest? Do you see them as a, a ripe field of wheat? Or do you see them as a contagion that will taint who you are because you've been placed there? Ouch! You've got to see him with his eyes. When Jesus sat around the table, he was only after giving a hard time to, to those religious bigots that were so uptight they squeaked, that they weren't loose. All right? When Zacchaeus was in that tree, he says, come on down, man. I'm going to feast in your house today. And what happened? Man, Zacchaeus opened up, and he changed because he was accepted. And when we in our uppity-uppitists cannot sit amongst them recognizing that they are a harvest and they are rich for the, for the kingdom. We have betrayed our Father's heart. Yeah, I know that's a hard one, but I really want you to start seeing his heart. 
I want you to experience it. You know, in my life, I love being outside the church because, you know, I love you as my family, but when I'm out in the marketplace and I'm, I'm walking amongst the people that they're drawing the love of Christ out of me and they walk up and they just, they just want to stand next to me. You know, at my job at the airport, there are times when I see very broken people come through. And yesterday was a good example. A lady was coming through, and she was broken. And she was at a pretty, I'd say about a seven in anxiety. And she was about 10 feet away, and by the time, within about three minutes, with the help of my team, with the help of my team, we got her down to where she was down to about a one or two. I played my part with my team. The same goes true with you. You are part of a family, a team, a part of the kingdom of God, the ambassadors of Christ, the herald of his kingdom. Find your place and role in that and do just what you're meant to do and you will see the impact on the harvest. Amen? Hallelujah. Patty, if you could bring up uh, Revelations 21.17. Talk about, I'm just going to just throw what a measure of a man is. You'll see it in Revelation. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. Now, the measure of a man, I just wanted to throw this up. And I'm sure many of you understand what, what the measure of a man is. It was from the tip of the middle finger to the elbow. Now, the, the, the symbolism I want to show you is that where is your realm of influence? Between here and here. When someone comes near you, as you are praising God, with your sacrifice, your hands are like this. Who's there amongst you? Who's within this realm, within the length of your hands? Where can you reach out and touch somebody? From the tip of your middle finger to your elbow, how far will you extend yourself to extend the kingdom of God, to touch somebody that needs a touch? Amen? Think about this. This is where he's taking us. These are the, the things I want to show you, just to keep in the back of your mind so when you're praying, you go, Lord, where's, where are those people I want to touch within this distance? Hallelujah. Amen? Let's go to the next one. Number nine. Wow, that's pretty. I like that. That's a nice flower. Not quite the red. There we go. We're getting there. There we go. Number nine, be aware of God's cautions. All right, this is the thing, you know, as, as all of us, we, we learn our boundaries. We learn those cautions of the Lord. He speaks it into us. You know as soon as you get out of the shadow of his wings. And you go, ooh, hello. I think I'm out of here. I'm going to back up a little bit. Just excuse me a minute. You know, you know what I'm talking about. You know the caution that the Spirit says? You know, and what's really fun, and I, ha I put it this way, you know, what happens is the Spirit inside of us is always, you know, God speaking inside of us. And our Spirit's going, yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden our, our, little, our little thinking kicks in, and we take it one more word, and we add it to God's, and then it goes, blah. Oh. <laughs> you know, and then you feel this, like, on the shoulder, yeah, that wasn't you, was it? That was all me. I take full responsibility for that one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Dad. I'm sorry. He's, he's like, you know what? That's okay. Because you were trying to get it out, and your exuberance caught up into it and flung a little bit extra into it that it wasn't there. But you know what? I got you covered. And you know what? Out of a loving heart of a son or daughter, you won't do that again. You won't. You don't, want to, you don't want to hurt dad. You don't want to hurt his reputation. Well, his reputation is the, in, on the line in our lives. What we speak about him is true, hopefully. What we live is true, hopefully, many times. Just let him feel that little tap on the shoulder. He, he keeps us cautious. He'll let us know. 
If we take a little bit too far, he goes, ah. okay, hallelujah. Thank you. Thank him for his grace, amen. Thank you for his mercy in that. Because you know what? Exuberance is fun. We love to have the zeal of the Lord, not the zeal of Mike. Because the zeal of the Lord will take you places. The zeal of Mike, it'll get you killed in the street, okay? <laughs> so that's why I'm real careful about that, okay? Hallelujah. Let's go on to number 10. This is, this is important to me. Number one, for me first. Life is not about privacy, but about transparency. And, and you know, many that have been around me for a while in my ministry, they know that I'm, I, I'm the first one to tell you that I'm not always right. You know, I will share with you when I mess up. Because you know what? I don't want you seeing me as somebody high and mighty on, a thro- on, a, on some stool that I'm going to get knocked off of. I want you to see that I am just as human as you, but I am pressing into God and and hearing him the best I know how. And you know what? That should encourage you because if I'm I'm the set guy and I'm the first one in line for the spankings or the pat on the heads, you know, you, you guys are right there with me. And you will see that. You will see. I want to be transparent with you. And the same goes for you. Be transparent with those that God puts in your metron and that are around you in that place of influence, you know. Because when you come across as, as pious or all-knowing or, or, you know, just, oh, I'm the best thing since sliced bread, what does that normally cause? People don't want to be around you because they smell pride coming a block and a half away. And they don't need that. They need acceptance. They need some wisdom. They need understanding. They need uh, someone to walk in love with them, that will cry with them when they cry and rejoice with them when they're rejoicing and run a race with them. Run the race with them. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I want to bring up 1 John 1, 7, especially in this one, about being transparent. Now, being transparent in the dark, you can't tell if they're transparent or not. Transparency comes into a play when there's light being revealed. You see through. The light of God inside of you, through your transparency, will shine forth. The transparency of the lighthouse uh, Fenzel lenses lets the light of the lighthouse out to bring safety and direction to the ships on the ocean. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with what? One another. And the blood of Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This is the relationship of being transparent. We come into the fellowship with one another. And as we walk in the light as he is in the light, this is that thing I've been kind of speaking about carefully for a couple of weeks, about the light lifestyle. It's something that the, the Lord is, is, is working within me to, to qualify and to solidify what it is to be, have a light lifestyle. A light lifestyle is walking in the light as he is in the light. He is in the light. He is the light. And we walk in him. And as we are transparent before each other and in fellowship, this is where the blood washes us and cleanses us. And we have that ability to share on all levels. Sharing on all levels. Sharing the truth of what God has helped us do to multiply it and reproduce in another person's life. So we must learn to walk. Walk in that light. Be transparent. Hallelujah. Okay, uh, number 11. Proverbs 30, uh, 21 and 22. We're getting there. This is one of the things that, uh, that came forth uh, in the round table that, that really spoke strongly into me. For three things, the earth is perturbed. Okay. Yes, for four, it cannot bear up. For a servant when he reigns, a fool when he is filled with food. I want to look at this one. For a servant when he reigns. Uh, depending on the, the scripture, another one says when a slave is king, um, there's a, a mentality shift that has to occur in the body of Christ in this territory where we get out of this slave mentality 
All right, there's, a, there's so many people that tell, oh, I'm a slave to this, the gospel. I'm a slave to this. I'm a slave to that. You know, Jesus said himself, I no longer call you that. I call you friends. There's a transformation that's going on in relationship. As we are transparent, we go from that slave mentality to the friendship re- relationship. It's where we foster life amongst each other. And the, the thing that really strikes me is, I don't know, just give me a second. When you take a slave mentality and you come in to the kingship of the king of being crowned, you never relinquish your slavery mentality. If you don't renounce it, it has to be renounced. It's the slavery to all the things of the past. And you know who has you know within your own lives when you have a slave mentality a poverty spirit, a slave to your old man, the old ways. And God's created you into a new creature, a new creature in Christ. So he brings us to this place where we have to relinquish the slave to, to come in and reign. And God's calling to this the Northwest Territory that, you know what, folks, you've been enslaved for so long under this. Now it's time to reign with me in this area, in this territory. Set aside your old way of thinking. Get the mind of Christ in you and start to walk it out. It's critical for the the moment that we live in, this moment in time. Number 12, this is why we have to get into this understanding of reigning. This is not an arrogant place. It is a place where God has commissioned and made us to be in. We are seated and enthroned in Christ. We are in Him. We don't do this on our own. This is in him. As long as you're in him, you reign righteously. When you start reigning in your own thing, that's control and manipulation. And, boy, you do not want to go there. Because, either, number one, when he starts lifting the rug on that and starting showing all the stuff you've hidden, it's going to get real ugly, and you won't like the outcome. So we stay rooted in him in humility. Kingly anointing. Come out of the cave, King David and Elijah. The cave was a place of process. Uh, one of the things they talked about, and I'm just going to briefly go over it, they talked about King David. They talked about Elisha, Elijah. I mean, Elijah was in the cave. Why? Because Jezebel was going to kill him. She said, I'm going to take your life, blah, 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 blah. He bugged out of there like a jackrabbit with a big old hound on his tail. He went into a cave and hid. And what did God say to him? What are you doing? What are you doing? He called him out, spoke to him, and we know what happened next. He, t- he, had, he took the rebuke of the Lord and the transition of the anointing to Elisha. David himself, when he came out of the cave of Adullah, okay, he went from there and he went to Judah, which is where the kings were, were made king. They were ordained in Judah. This is the difference between the slave mentality and the kingship. You don't want to go and, and lose the calling on your life to another, to trans- transition to another, you want to go to the proper place where kings are, are ordained. That's Judah. That's praise. There's an attitude of praise that comes in the midst of that when you're seated in that. You praise him because he's the one that's kinging. He's bringing you in. You're seated in him. You're enthroned in him. It's the praise. And the cave was a, the cave was a place of process. If you've been in a cave, you've been in the process. You've been in the meat grinder. You've been in that place where character's built. It's, it's, not, it's not fun. It's dark. It's stinking. It's usually wet, muggy, buggy. Everything you can imagine is not comfortable in a cave. If you find a cave that's comfortable, let me know because uh, there's something going on. Okay? It's a place of process. What else happens in caves? They bury people. Okay? When they throw you in there, you're dead. You're dead. Lazarus was sleeping, all right? He was in the cave. Everybody says, he's been dead. He's going to stink. Don't roll the stone away. Leave him in there. Gosh, please, Jesus, don't do it. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be zombie apocalypse coming out of the cave. Jesus says, roll away the stone. Just do it. And then what did he do? He spoke that name. If you're in a cave today, you need to hear his name calling, his voice calling your name. It's the only thing that's going to bring you out. And if you sit back in the back of that cave and say, I'm not worthy of coming out, you're lied to by the enemy. 
because this is your moment in time. Your destiny is stirring. It's, we spoke it to be awakened this morning. It's time to get out of the cave. You know what? You've got to stand before his face and see him and hear his voice because he's not coming in that cave to get you. Did Jesus walk in there and get him out? No. He says, come out. Lazarus, come forth. Elijah in the cave, what did God do? Did you go in there and get him? No. What are you doing? And then what did he do? He came to the, the mouth of the cave. You got it, okay? I'm going to peek out. I'm still under the shadow of this cave. I'm safe. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're near death. Get out of the cave. Hear him call your voice to life. Come on out. Whew, that's good. Galatians 4.2. If you got your Bibles, Galatians 4.2. We are under, but it is under the guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. This is your moment. You're under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. You've been in that cave of process. You've gone through this thing, and you're just like, I'm stinking tired of this cave. Stinking tired of it. I'm not tired of the, of the work of God in my life. It has not been pleasant one step of the way. But you know what? It's been worth every touch of his fingers on me. I want to hear that out of you guys eventually. I want you, because you know what? In my life, when I came out of the cave, it was like, you know what? The process of hell that I went through was worth it. Because I, what I thought was hell was the fire of God, not the hell fires. It was the fire of God in a fiery furnace in the crucible. Because the crucible looks like a cave, feels like a cave, but it's got God's fire in it to purify and bring it about. That's the difference. Get the proper perspective of what God's doing in your life. 2 Samuel 5.12. We're, we're circling in. we got one more round and we're going to land. So David knew that the Lord had established him. This is, he was in the cave of Abdullah. Hiding out. Saul did you know, all that stuff. David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel. Now, he'd been as, it hasn't happened yet, but he knew that's what destiny was. He knew where it was. He knew where it laid. He could taste it. He could feel it, but it wasn't there yet. But in that moment that the father knows that the tutoring is done and release of kingship happens, then that he was exalted let me do it. So David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. There are, there are people that are at stake here. For their sake, it's time for you to come out of the cave. Your family needs you to come out of the cave. Your brothers and sisters need you to come out of the cave because you were designed for a specific purpose. You are uniquely designed as a a cog, a misfit, because you will fit in a specific moment in time to release the kingdom of God to not only yourself but those around you. Amen? See where God has made you and designed you to fit. Hallelujah, Lord. Come out of that cave in Jesus' name. Your day of process has come to an end. And the last one, number 13. And I love this one. Bobby spoke this, and I'll tell you, I've heard him say it before, but, man, it just it resounds inside of me. Don't kill with your character what the anointing builds. Man, that one smacked good. Don't kill with your character what the anointing of God inside of you builds. Mm, that one hits me right in the heart. Because I'll tell you, you know, anointing, 
the call of God is without reproach. That ability God's put inside of you can be used for anything. It can be used for godly uses or ungodly. In my job yesterday, I crossed paths with a psychic. And I had the opportunity to uh, do a pat down on him. Because that's what I do at the airport when, they, when you have to get a pat down. You know, you, get, you have to make sure there's nothing bad on the person. So here I am laying hands on a psychic who was of a, an alternate lifestyle proudly before me anyhow. Now, you don't think that was a setup. <laughs> My character, if it, had not, if, if it was not able to carry this properly, I would have blown the mission. But you know what? I looked that man in the eyes with the, li- the love of Christ in me, and I, as I laid hands on him, I released blessing on him. That way, my character didn't destroy and kill what was anointed to be done. Do you sit in the harvest or are you afraid of being contaminated? Jesus never was. Why should I? There is life in these hands. Look at your hands. Look at your hands. There is life in those hands from, the, from God himself. And when you touch people, you do it with purpose, purpose of his kingdom. I lay hands on myself all the time because there's times there's people not around that can do that to me. Let the God-given character building from the cave Bring forth life into you. Jesus. Amen. Proverbs 16, 19, and we're going to close with this one. Mm, This is good. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for today. And what was really fun during that, that moment in time is he was saying, have fun. And you know what? I was because I was slapping heaven all over that guy. (laughs) Hallelujah. A man's heart plans his way, but the, the Lord directs his steps. That is for you. A man's heart plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. I love that promise to me. And you know what's really exciting about that? My heart has been captured by the heart that created man. And my heart is is catching up with how he feels and taking on his likeness and his loves and his desires, not mine. So now I can say my heart is becoming like his heart, that my steps are fully directed by him. Father, I thank you for this word this morning. And I thank you that it is spoken deep into the midst of who we are. And Lord, I thank you that our destiny is an ancient call on our lives. And we have spoken that it would be awakened. Because our destiny was laid out before the beginning of time. And it was for this moment in time that we were designed. And that you have captured our heart and that you are directing our steps, and it is your strength and your desire and your your love that keeps us going. Father, I speak blessing over this family, over these those that are here to hear this word. Lord, I thank you that this word is an alive agent of change and that it is your word that is sharper than any two-edged sword that pierces, that pierces our hearts to release the goodness of the kingdom of God, that deposit you've placed inside of us, Lord, that your kingdom come, 
your will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, Father, for the covering, the anointing, and the blessing. And we herald your kingdom and the greatness of who you are, that all praise and glory is yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah.